I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick, and we're going to talk about the 2023 American Heart Association scientific statement on the cardiopulmonary impact of electronic cigarettes and vaping. Let me say this. This snuck up on us. The FDA tried to keep vaping products off the market initially, saying they were a drug delivery device, but in court on litigation from the company, the FDA lost in 2010. Since that time, vaping use among high school students has increased from 1% in 2011 to the current 10 to 20 percent of all high school students are current vapors. That number may be beginning to decrease now. The prevalence of vaping nicotine products has totally eclipsed cigarette use among youth, and the current use of cigarettes in high school students is about 2 percent. Let's start with what is vaping. Now, I'm using the term vaping to encompass e-cigarettes and vaping products. The term used in the scientific statement is ENDS, meaning electronic nicotine delivery systems. In these systems, a heating coil vaporizes fluid that's put in the device. The fluid typically has a vehicle of propylene glycol and glycerol. That vehicle contains nicotine as well, usually, and flavorings, things like fruit, menthol, mint, candy, dessert flavors are common. Tetrahydrocannabinol can and often is added to the liquid and vaped as well. The aerosolized vapor formed by contact with the liquid in the heating coil is then inhaled. Let's now focus on the effects of vaping. The constituents, the fluids we mentioned, have both individual effects and combined effects. Let's start with nicotine, which binds nicotine receptors and has an effect as a sympathomimetic, increase in heart rate, contractility, workload, and blood pressure, all of which can theoretically over time lead to cardiac remodeling, heart failure, and an increased susceptibility to arrhythmias. Then there's propylene glycol and glycerol, which have emerging evidence of direct cardiopulmonary effects, including in some people wheezing, dry cough, and throat irritation. The different flavorings have, again, differing effects as well. Sweeteners, for instance, when aerosolized, generate reactive aldehydes, which are thought to be the main contributors to cigarette-induced cardiovascular disease and COPD. Other flavorings can cause things like DNA damage in vascular and lung tissue. You get a sense that there's a lot of potential damage that occurs from the things that are inhaled with vaping. Nickel and chromium is released from the heating elements and inhaled along with the aerosol. They've been shown in rat models to lead to pneumonitis and pulmonary inflammation, and it's worth noting that nickel is believed to be a carcinogen. Both nicotine-containing and non-nicotine-containing products can lead to increases in platelet aggregation, platelet reactivity, vascular stiffness, and reactive oxygen species, as well as decreasing brain glucose utilization. People who vape have an increased likelihood of chronic cough, phlegm production, and irritation of the upper airway. Animal studies have suggested that the aerosol can lead to ciliary dysfunction in the airway, and nasal scrapings of people who vape show suppression of immune and inflammatory response genes, suggesting an increased susceptibility to infection among those who vape. Some studies show that vaping can induce obstructive airway deficits. The effect is likely greater in those who are predisposed to obstructive airway disease to begin with. There have also been reports of eosinophilic pneumonitis, hypersensitivity pneumonia, and interstitial lung disease after vaping. Now, in addition to the common adverse effects, vaping has been associated with a new clinical entity called EVALI, which stands for e-cigarette or vaping associated lung injury. 
through 2020, there were over 2,800 hospitalizations and 68 deaths from Ivali. Patients present with general symptoms of fatigue and fever, but also with prominent GI symptoms and respiratory distress. Chest x-rays can show uh, a diffuse symmetric bilateral ground glass appearance. Half of the cases of a valley have required ICU admission. Briefly, on a separate note, we're sometimes asked whether vaping can be used for smoking cessation. While it is not FDA approved for smoking cessation, the scientific statement cites a recent Cochrane analysis that showed that nicotine containing vaping products were about 50% more effective than nicotine replacement therapy. Back to adverse effects. All of the adverse effects I've discussed are, by necessity, short-term effects because e-cigarettes just have not been around long enough for us to see and study the long-term effects. So until that long-term data is available, animal models serve as the best available surrogate for the question of whether vaping increases long-term cardiopulmonary risk. Those animal models suggest that vaping increases oxidative stress, inflammation, and DNA damage, which suggests that it may increase the risk of COPD and lung cancer. The American Heart Association scientific statement concludes that the presence of these acute effects, and I'll quote here, suggests that electronic nicotine delivery system use is not benign and raises the possibility that adverse impacts can accumulate over time. In addition, the scientific statement notes that the physiologic effects of vaping are similar to the findings that are shown in early stages of cigarette smoking. My summary, vaping's not a good idea. The nicotine and the products make it addictive and there are demonstrated short-term side effects that range from mild to very severe, including ICU emissions. There's also a high likelihood of long-term damage to the lungs, heart, and vascular system. Let me know what you think. What would you tell your child or grandchild about vaping? I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick, and this is Medscape.